not that many people, so I guess we can make it kind of collaborative. So, if I'm speaking too fast, or uh, you have a question, feel free to ask me. If it's coming up in a future thing I'm going to talk about in a few minutes, as it sometimes does, I'll just like to ask you to wait until then. And if it's not answered then, then I'll probably remember an answer. That's probably the best way to do those things. Um, so I'm just going to walk through uh, our evolution in terms of working with smart contracts, where we started out, some of the things uh, we realized, and, and where we ended up with our newest product, smartcontract.com. So where we started uh, was something called Secure Asset Exchange. So Secure Asset Exchange has now become the largest decentralized asset exchange by daily volume. Whoa, 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 what does that mean? Come on. Come on, don't hold me. No bullshit on numbers. All right, give it to us real. If it's imaginary money that nobody can really trade because it's an illiquid market, let's not discuss it. Okay, okay? keep it real. I want it real. Okay. And a lot of you. I'm a great <laughs> If only five people in the world can trade it, it's not a marketplace. All right. So when we started with smart contracts here, was these buying these sellers. They are written into the NXT blockchain as something called a virtual transaction. What a virtual transaction means is that it locks in either the cryptocurrency or the digital token created on the platform into a pending state. In that pending state, it sits on the blockchain, assuring that the cryptocurrency and the digital token are still in the possession of each individual wallet, and therefore cannot be double spent. Um, but it still puts it into this pending state on the NXT blockchain where you basically send a signal of I'm willing to sell, for example, the bear mining digital token, which is a mining share token, or some other digital token which I created to represent whatever. Um, I'm willing to sell it for X of cryptocurrency. Likewise, somebody puts up against the same digital token, I'm willing to buy X digital token for Y cryptocurrency. Now, this is where these things start to get substantially more interesting, where you have a layer of blockchain, which is basically a very uh, rudimentary uh, matching engine that can do partial fill orders. So what happens with those two pending buy and sell orders on the NXT blockchain is that as part of the logic of NXT, uh, you have a matching engine, which will basically match those two orders and exchange them like any transaction. It is just another transaction type, it's not predetermined which node is going to generate that transaction. Um, it's, it's simply another transaction type. Now, sometimes, once people have, well, what, what does this actually mean? What, what this actually means is that you have a, a layer of logic on top of a decentralized database. I just, I just think of all of this stuff as infrastructure. And I'm not particularly married to NXT, I'm not like married to any infrastructure. I don't get emotional about infrastructure. I haven't seen many other spaces where people are exceptionally connected or deeply, like emotionally linked with their infrastructure, right? I'm not. I, I, I'm a big, I'm a fan of NXT, and we use it simply because they ship and they don't waste my time with hype. Um, in any case, what I just described in terms of the logic, in my opinion, is the first uh, moder <coughs> moderately to, to large scale implementation of decentralized computing. Because, you know, in order to really have decentralized computing, it has to be based on a decentralized database. That just seems to make sense to me. It seems like that would be the logical evolution, which is basically what we have for what we call a matching engine smart contract. So everything happens entirely on the blockchain here at the level of logic on the 300 networks nodes, um, you know, with a consensus algorithm that decides which node will, will rent, well, more than not randomly, which node will generate the actual buy and sell order transaction. Yeah. How about how many next nodes are running on average per day? We're about 300. There's about 300. Right now we're at 59,000 smart contract matching engine transactions that have happened this way. Um, I mean, this is markedly different than some other approaches where you put in data and you simply reconstruct from the data. Here you have the data sitting and waiting in a layer of logic on 300 plus nodes being executed 59,000, already executing 59,000 transactions. So, that's, I, I don't know any, I don't know any words to find this right now. I hope, I haven't found it. Um, this, our first product was, was really a, a very secure web layer into this infrastructure. And 
uh, like one of the fundamental tenets of our company, and I think just a good fundamental tenet in general, is that you don't become a centralized point of failure in a decentralized system. Because it doesn't really make sense to me that you would build, you know, you would build a company. Obviously, you need to build a company. You need to facilitate people's use of the product in an intelligent way. Um, at the same time, you don't want to like keep all the passwords. We don't keep any of the passwords uh, for this at all, or our previous cryptocurrency products. Um, it makes things a bit more difficult technically <coughs> because we can't do things on the user's behalf that we could if we just had access to everything. But at the same time, if 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 our, one of our if something like Secure Asset Exchange becomes successful, um, it's an important technical trade-off because it 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 doesn't. You can, you can see why, right? Like, if everybody's passwords and access to a decentralized infrastructure is a decentralized resource, all of a sudden you have, you know, I think what is the favorite term? Point of failure. What's your point of failure? What's my point of failure? Um, yeah, so that's a point of failure. Um, How did you come to that decision that, you know, it's a technical trade off worth making? Long term, like, I. Yeah, you know, I'm saying, you know, when you go out to the market, from a user acceptance perspective. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That I'll show you, let me show you. I'll show you right now. I'll show you what that trade-off looks like as a user, the user's perspective. Okay. So you go sign up. <clears throat> By the way, this is not made for like user users. This is made for like crypto people. Users. <laughs> <laughs> I see what you're saying. We'll get to that. <laughs> we'll get to that in our new program. Okay. So, okay. Uh, I'm Paul Dragos, by the way. So just... Woo, yeah, Paul. No, we put in a bit, so. Yeah, okay. yeah. Uh, good to see you. Um, so you basically just put in the you know, whatever username, you generate a very secure password that it will take a lot of computing power to, uh, to break. Uh, you never keep any of this, you accept our terms of service, input our password, and you log in. That's it. Then you really should remember your password. That's okay. For this technical trade-off, if you're building products with this decision in mind, if people lose their password, they are screwed. Sometimes they might also log in with a different password, with an extra space or an extra word or whatever, and, all, and uh, you know, it generates a, new, a different account. And they become confused as to why they are logged in, but not into their own account. So, it's weird. It can be a little freaky. So, you have to like really put up messages. Hey, don't forget your password. I'm just going to save you a bunch of support requests. Always like give them a big red message and make them re-enter their password if they use the system. And B, um, like make it clear they have to like space and capitalization, all that stuff matters. Put up messages about that if you don't want to spend a few nights on support books. You were six. Yeah. Don't you think that at some point it becomes a problem to get millions of dollars on a platform like this because you know it's inevitable that some corporation, if they are gonna use it, is gonna lose password. So at that point you have millions of dollars lost and then it kind of sets a wild card. Look, all these things are trade-offs. Like anybody tells you they have a magical solution, they probably just haven't tried building it and haven't run into 16 different trade-offs they've had. I'm just conveying to you the trade-off we've made and the reasons we've made. You put a million dollars in, you can remember a few passwords, you can download and put it into a text file, an email into a few servers or write it down on paper. If you can't do that and you have a million dollars, then there's a paradox. I mean, I don't know thing. It does happen. And lots of stuff. Like, yeah, maybe. I don't know. Very possible. Well, before they, in this consortium, it's that fallback. But for right. password, it's fallback. If you don't have that, you can never even... Right. Historically, it does happen. That's how we're really used to the idea. I actually have a substantial amount of content to get through, so I'll just run through it, and then if there's more questions, we'll totally... That's okay. Um, okay, so that smart contract type is, is pretty cool. Um, when I said the largest decentralized asset exchange, um, I just meant by daily volume, I just meant to illustrate that, you know, um, there's no counterparty risk when you have a matching engine smart contract type, because our exchange neither has your password, nor has any custody of tokens, nor has any custody of cryptocurrency. And, yeah, that's, that has a pronounced psychological effect on how people uh, view their risks. In terms of in terms of trading and, and things like this, um, so yeah, so that was the first first smart contract type. Uh, we basically at the smartcontract.com decided to expand that capability. So instead of saying you know you can only use this capability to do asset transfer and just trading digital tokens, which is great, 
but unfortunately, making that a thing is going to take a bit more time than I initially thought, as usual. Um, so, our next product, smartcontract.com, we basically let you choose a data source. So we, we go in and I'm just going to demo the, some of the basic functionality and tell you, tell you what starts happening. We, we can, we'll actually just make a smart contract right now and I'll show you how it gets written to the blockchain. I'll show you guys and then I'll show you specifically what, what gets written in and then what gets read. Yeah. Is this the next blockchain or the Bitcoin blockchain? So we use Bitcoin for payments. Uh, we use NXT right now for storing the data. Uh, it was simply because it was infrastructure that was built for this purpose. Um, there's less technology risk of the Bitcoin of, of, of the core developers one day deciding that it is, it is undesirable to have non-payments related data in their blockchain. It's like like I said again, not emotionally connected, super emotionally connected to infrastructure. It's just there's technology risk and. <clears throat> That's it. Like whenever you choose infrastructure for any architectural decision, you should consider technology risk. If, if tomorrow morning you have a more secure blockchain that's very well at facilitating putting other data into it, okay, great. Maybe we'll do that. Why not? Very tech, that's, that's totally the logic behind the entire decision. Um, in any case, so let's say you have cheese.com, you want to be between 1 to 10 with a few phrase cheese. And here, um, you would choose a data source. So this, this, to give you an example, this would be a contract between, uh, like... Can we start from the top? It says payment with escrow. What does that mean? That looks very interesting. Oh, okay. Um, so we, we have two... Well, then I'll give you guys a, high, a higher level thing to explain what that is. So when you think about smart contracts, the first thought is, wouldn't it be great if everything was on the blockchain magically and everybody did everything on the blockchain, we had virtual governments, and we had virtual income tax, we had virtual health insurance payments, virtual everything. Everything was virtual and it was just super. And everything would be transparent and it'd be great. But that's going to take some time. So not so much. So in, in reality, there's two ways you can do smart contracts. Uh, you can make it a tracking layer on top of existing legal agreements, right? Because people already make legal agreements. We make legal agreements for large contractual value that um, creates risk, and that risk is then mitigated by insurance, which is a huge industry meant to mitigate risk, or make a lot of people might depend on where you sit. But um, so a smart contract can be a tracking layer mitigating that risk by instead of you having a lot of subjective components where you kind of make a legal document and you go, um, I am going to do it. And I'm probably going to do it. And if I don't, here's 16 clauses of what happens if I don't, which you're not going to take me to court for anyway, because it costs more money to take me to court than the thing you asked me to do. And, and then the assessment, you know, the, there's like concepts of consideration, and there's concepts of like satisfaction. And if you ever get into these legal concepts, it becomes immensely clear that like it's so subjective. Or you could have a piece of data that are, you know, adjudicates the contract. <coughs> so in the contract that I was just showing you, the piece of data is SEO rank. We have this library right now. It could be site traffic. It could be GPS data. It could be basically any piece of data that both parties agree is significant and trustworthy enough in order for them to agree, to, to automatically agree, if that data shows that, for example, cheese.com has gotten into the 1 to 10 rank on Google, Google friends, for example. Right? Um, so with escrow and without escrow, uh, without escrow, it's just a tracking layer. So what we allow you to do is to go here and attach any existing legal legal document. You attach any existing legal document. That legal document is then hashed. Which, for folks that aren't as familiar with that, you generate a really log number that's going to prove that, that, that the file is the file, more or less. Um, so it's then hashed, and then the hash of the attached documents is placed in the blockchain. So you can always verify what was ESAM. So to answer Tariq's question, right now you're just applying the tracking layer in, in our application, which you can all do right now because this is live. Um, you're applying the tracking layer on top of an existing legal agreement to mitigate all kinds of risk by using data rather than relying on people's subjective assessment of, yes, it is in the top 10, but no, we said it was Belgium and France. No, we just said France, right? 
Um, with escrow, so once you have a tracking layer, in theory, you can also create automated events, right? So contracts are usually just a set of conditions, which uh, for technical purposes, to keep this nice and dry and technical, um, can be very well translated into something called, you know, finite state machines. So you just have things going from state to state to state in a contract, and you can pretty much define, that's actually one of the ways that we were thinking about it when we were initially architecting this. That we want to th think about um, contractual, you know, progress in, in, in the sense of finite state machines. So it just goes from one state to another state to another state, right? So, you know, but, and then, and then we boiled it down to what are the conditions. Basically, it's very simple. In every contractual clause that you look at, more or less, there's an if condition, then there's a then condition, then there's an otherwise condition. If you do this, then you get this. Otherwise, if that happens, you pay me something, you know, something happens. Um, so here, the, the tracking layer can kick off something called uh, Bitcoin escrow. And Bitcoin escrow, basically, this, um, that little spinny thing is, it means it's waiting for your Bitcoin. It's waiting to receive your Bitcoin, it's going to get your Bitcoin, it's going to log into multi-signature, it's going to wait until the tracking layer says, hey, guess what, it did happen. Um, then it's going to release the Bitcoin to the designated parties. So, you know. Um, I'm just going to send it both to myself just so I can sign the contract. Because when you designate anybody in the contract, your system automatically requires that they sign it with a cryptographic <coughs> signature. But one of the things that we did was we also added um, an email capability. So you can um, invite anybody via email. They'll get an email, invite them to collaborate and stuff like this, but uh, for technical purposes, you just designate, you know, tracking letter set X, therefore, Sergey gets Bitcoin escrow, or if it said Y, then you know, Steve gets Bitcoin as well. So now we've made what we call a smart term. Uh, then we can attach a document. We can define some CO contract testing. Um, that, all of that's also written to the blockchain. So basically, everything that's, that could be legally binding is written to the blockchain. Basically, so you can reconstruct the, the agreement even if something happens to our company. So why don't we do this? I'm going to just quickly finish up. Um, right. We also have a signature deadline by which time you have to sign. If you don't sign by the signature deadline, the contract is void, and you know that's also updated and all that stuff. It's very similar to existing contractual things where they like you know, have to sign if you have two weeks to sign. Um, Um, so actually, let me go here. Okay. So this is me logged in to, to an account that will show us that it's actually going to be written into the blockchain, this contract. So now I go and I can finalize contract and I can finalize and publish. And here's my contract waiting for signature. If I had added other people, it would ask them to sign. Uh, what happens when you sign is basically. One other relatively cool, one interesting decision NXT made was instead of an Azure system, they focused it around an account system. So we literally give everybody uh, the same secure account and the same secure password system that I told you about for Secure Asset Exchange, and allow them to basically crypt cryptographically sign, well, cryptographically sign this. So this is the contract, and it being put into the blockchain. So there is, you know, ID, a next ID, um, a description, there's something about attachments. Uh, this is basically, uh, you have your signature key, plus, and, and it's all going back to specific users and XT IDs. Um, I mean, you guys can make a contract and, and analyze the contract, JSON, to your heart's content. It's relatively simple, just to minimize complexity, you know, they like super complex systems for no reason. Um, yeah, there's just a, a number of cryptographic signatures. You, we display the uh, NXT ID and we display the cryptographic signature related to this and then and the cor corresponding hash and the secret and all these things so you can always reconstruct the timeline. Um, 
Yeah. How long does it take for a block to get my uh, forged in NXT? NXT? It takes two minutes. Two minutes. Two minutes. Two minutes. So, how secure would you say is an NXT blockchain versus the Bitcoin blockchain? I mean, if you could look at the two and speak to that, I mean, given that you're putting, you know, complex contract in here. I mean, there hasn't been a problem yet. Uh, two minutes seems like a good limit. Uh, what I've heard at the secure limit for block generation times from all the people I've spoken to, I think actually Matt spoke last time and he said something. But you guys nearly had a hard fork early on this year, didn't you? Next, next you had a hard fork. Yeah, that, that wasn't really a hard fork. That was an interesting situation um, where somebody stole some money yeah. and they tried to do a re it was a substantial amount of money from an exchange. And they were going to reorg all the blocks, right? Well, they did reorg all the blocks. But it came up that they were going to, consider. They weren't going to. What, what they did. It's a really interesting, if you guys want to think about an interesting situation, let's say you're a core developer of a cryptocurrency, right? And somebody steals some money from an exchange, a large amount of money. And then the exchange comes a cry and goes, oh my god, how did this happen? Got over it. And you, you can't really make people do anything. What you can do is you can give them a version of before there's a, you know, there's a checkpoint or there's some kind of a hard stop on, on, on the chain, you can give them a version that they could theoretically choose to mine as the main chain, and then decide that it's the main chain in order to screw the thief out of his money. Right? So there's like been this extraordinary, very screwy event. Yeah? And you as the core developer, on behalf of basically the exchange, have, instead of saying, hey, exchange, no. Instead of just like going saying, bye bye. You say, okay, sure, here, here's the thing that people could mine within 720 blocks to make it so that this obviously extraordinarily bad event was, um, doesn't actually happen. But if I put a billion dollar contract on that blockchain and uh -huh. then somebody steals again in the future yeah. and this reorg discussion comes up, how secure am I with my contract in this particular type of blockchain? Well, the key, the reorg didn't happen. I know, but the guy ended up taking it. What if it happened again? Hypothetically speaking, I mean, and I put a billion dollars. It's, it's hard for me to speak. Like, what if there's a bunch of ASICs in China near a factory mm -hmm. in Shenzhen, and people click on tomorrow? What happens? What happens? Okay. What do we? You know, where does our funding go? <laughs> or whatever. It is. So I don't know. All I know is the real didn't happen. The guy stayed with his money, just like a real wouldn't have happened with Bitcoin. So essentially, the outcome is exactly the same. Um, yeah. It makes sense to me that they gave people the option. Okay. And that's the, the thing that there's a 720 block limit. So that's yeah. If you can, if there's an extraordinary event, maybe you should have some kind of small time. Oh. Uh, yeah. Yeah. How do you see this evolving? Um, are you a an infrastructure layer, or are you going to you know lean towards certain opportunities or industry verticals or? I mean, how should we think about you? Our company? Yeah. Yeah. It's a technical presentation, so a really quick answer to this question. Uh, please, you're, you're in charge. Drive away. No marketing. <laughs> well, we can talk about markets. <laughs> anyway, no. Um, it's what the secure web layer that gives people a, use case, a way to use this infrastructure. Infrastructure, infrastructure, decentralized infrastructure is great. Um, I think it's great. I, su I support all the people making it. All of them. Counterparty, NXT, Ethereum, all these people. We're, we're so alike, it's, it, 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 it blows my mind. You know, like to, to, this early on in something's developing, just drop a bunch of stuff and go in all in on something like this. When you have other things on the table as a caveat. It means we're all pretty simple. So, yeah, infrastructure is a whole other game. For infrastructure, you've got to get a node network up. For infrastructure, you've got to worry about all kinds of things like consensus. You've got to do a whole bunch of stuff. I'm interested in, we're, we're interested in being the secure web layer that gives people uh, useful access to that infrastructure and therefore creates uh, the transaction fees which will, in theory, support it relatively soon. Right? So, that's interesting. So from where you're sitting, where, you know, what, what are some of the sweet spots? I mean, I'm looking at this, 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 this would be a nice check-in, check-out for M&A transactions, for example. It, it absolutely would. Um, if we have time, I'll definitely get back to all the different okay. contract types we have. Yep, okay. Right now, I think I'll just... Okay.
Great. <laughs> so I see, like, I see how this encodes in the uh, contract really well. Yeah. But what enforces the fact that the that the that's one of the side shows up in the search That's nice. That's uh, so, take a look at JSON. That's it's very simple, reusable uh, contract. So now I will go sign the contract. It will be signed. I just want to finish showing how how this process. This is a part of the process. Okay. Um, and then relatively soon we should see, see a message come. And this contract should probably actually come through because I think she is, is one of the top of the keywords which is now. Um, so yeah, then there's an expiration date. If by that expiration date it isn't completed, the system monitors it and it uh, turns it into a failed state. Uh, oh, okay. So there, completed. So when it completes, there should, the initial contract should be written in, and then there should also be a status update message. So we a payout just happened? Did something just happened? A payout didn't just happen. Um, we just we only used this as a tra as a tracking layer. Um, well, we actually used it as escrow. We just didn't put money into escrow. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, basically we verify um, uh, API for Google and. Then it showed that yeah, that this is in the top ten. So when you say escrow, where would you put the money in escrow? Into a multi-signature. Who has the signatures? <coughs> Who has the keys? So the signatures are held. Well, this is zero point. So right now the signatures are held by the initial folks that made it, and one signature by the verifying source. So two or three. Basically, um, in the future, when you have, ideally, what you would have is just a node network. That you could trust, that you could give a thousand signatures to, and all thousand would execute at the same time. Well, not a thousand, but like ten or five or something like this. Some of them um, that was more secure than two of them. But like I said, it's early days. Um, some people won't be comfortable for, with this, with this level of like signature security. That's totally their choice. Other folks are comfortable with it. They're used to bullets and other things. It's uh, it's really just a decision that, that they have to make. What it, what it really depends on is, is do we do we actually release on schedule and stuff like that. Um, so if we go here, right. So here here are the transactions related to this contract being written into the blockchain, right? And then we'll take a look at a minute when they're, when when the front end of our other product is confirmed. They're basically already in there. They just need to we just need to be able to come out. Um, but. Also, what we provide is we provide an understandable explanation of what is in the blockchain and what has happened with the data source. So we both write in what happened in a status update message, which I'll show you guys in a second, and we redisplay what actually happened with the data. So term one is completed, which basically means that you know, cheese is in the top ten at Google France. Actually, no. That was actually a risky bet. Who knows what's, what's cheese over there? For our Yeah, for much. For much. I would say probably nine for much is a good cheese. That was a risky bet. Wow. Imagine if that didn't work. Do you think so? Do you think so? So, yeah, so here we see. So, so that's like one example of a data source we pull. We can pull in multiple data sources. So you can you can check SEO, and you can make it so that there's a Bitcoin address that when it gets paid, it calculates the value of the Bitcoin paid in dollars, so that the attached agreement um, can remain in dollars while your Bitcoin payment is also calculated in dollars. Does that make sense? Sometimes it must be. So you, you make an agreement for $100,000, then the system, the system gives you a Bitcoin address where you can pay $100,000 of Bitcoin, and it calculates it at the current rate. Or you can pay five payments of $20,000. As long as you pay $20,000 in Bitcoin, and there we use an external API to pay the price. Um, so yeah, there, there are a number of services and APIs that are this is where an, there's an interesting discussion about the gradation between how much you want to trust an external public source, 
right? So what we started with uh, 40.1 are public sources, easily verifiable public sources, SEO, price, you know, public price numbers, uh, site traffic for a few things, simple to understand things. Yeah? Um, yeah. Is that one of the services that you, smartcontract.com, are providing is checking the data source and then updating? What happens if you know, what happens if you disappear in the middle of the in the middle of the contract? Who? Well, the way we have it set up is that if something ever happens to our servers and we restart them, it'll, it'll proactively like scrub all the past data. In, in any case, uh, one of the reasons we started with public data sources was we give you the hash of all the, of all the files that were assigned. We give you the entire contract, right? Including the text, all the text of the title and the description and all the smart terms. You know, in an intelligible way where you can reconstruct what the contract was. And right now you're basically contracting around public data sources. So if something were to ever happen to us, you could always reconstruct the entire contract without us and understand what happened. Does that make sense? Um, so this is a number of payments being tracked in USD. Let me show you guys what a... So these, this is a contract with a number of smart terms. Um, here's a document. And now I'm going to show you guys... Yeah, so here are attachments. Here is the hash of the document. So that uh, if anybody ever wants to prove anything, they can just hash that document again, come up with the same hash, and it's good as with these. Sorry. So when you price your contract in USD and you run it with the coin and then the price of Bitcoin goes down, how do you make up for the difference? You don't make up for the difference. You calculate at the time you pay. So you just owe more. What do you mean you owe more? Oh, cool. So do you know this is at the time, escrow at the time you pay. Is it, it's not escrow and, pay, and, and stabilized Bitcoin payment is two different things. Yeah. Escrow, you put the money into escrow, it sits in the multi signature state to be released upon data saying X or Y. Stabilize Bitcoin payments, you receive a Bitcoin app, you attach that document, you resign it, you hash and resign it, and then you have an address that will receive Bitcoin but will proactively, for every any amount of Bitcoin received, it will calculate it at the USD rate. So that you, you can still pay the contract in USD using Bitcoin. So you can pay a USD contract for five cents to somebody in China who's willing to accept Bitcoin on an agreement that was hashed and e-signed and stored in the blockchain. You do all that for five cents. That's the point of that. Yeah? Uh, how do you deal with the fact that there's multiple different exchange rates at any given time? Now choose an exchange. We sat there, we looked at all the different rates, there's a few people that aggregate it, there's a few people that do something else with it, there's a few people that have APIs that go down every 20 minutes, and then there's uh, there's large exchanges that have the APIs, bits. Like how does point do your price? How does anybody do you choose, you choose a large market play. That's it. So basically, that means that on the site, you're giving them a quote saying, like, if you want to pay in US dollars, you have to pay this much Bitcoin. Basically. Because they have to, you have to make sure that they know which exchange you're using, or else they might not pay enough, right? Yeah, but all this stuff shows up pretty quick in general. So they would know whatever they paid pretty quick. Um, but yeah, what you said is correct. That's basically what, what we have to do. Um, so, we'll see the contract. Sorry, none of the then the fields look like have Bitcoin addresses. So, there is an you know, effect showing up on the Bitcoin blockchain when this. And if that's taken. Yeah, the, in the if and then. It's sort of, you know, observing the Bitcoin blockchain is easy. What causes. The data source. No, 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 not data. How do you how do you affect the change in the Bitcoin blockchain with this? You mean in terms of releasing escrow? Yeah. So there's also Bitcoin two or three multi sig involved, or just the NXT platforms? Oh, okay, you were asking about NXT before. I was asking about Bitcoin. The the contracts go into the NXT blockchain. Basically, yes. But the money is in the Bitcoin blockchain. Yes. Okay, so the the signatures <coughs> are Bitcoin. You have to sign a multi-signature escrow, and then that gets released 
to the account's designated Bitcoin address. Right now, we do not provide a wallet service. We do not provide the Bitcoin address. You have another wallet that you trust to receive the Bitcoin. You provide the address in your account details. Well, you also trust the, that you can sign, right? Like, if you're trusting your counterparty, to sign on his side of the Bitcoin transaction. You're trusting our, our company to verify it. There's, there's no way to get around it until there's a decentralized computing infrastructure that can do a ton of stuff, like you know, pull in API data, verify these conditions, which is something we're talking about with a number of people. Until you have that, you basically have to trust somebody to verify enough. the data and sign off. Okay, so in that case, the, the platform, the smartcontract.com platform, has private keys associated with this multi-sig address and evaluates the contract on their end to decide what to sign for, right? Yeah, and okay. then, and then the, the, the difference here, and I, I see what you're getting at, and like I said, and you can build everything and then like launch it all at once, or you can incrementally make steps towards a better solution. This incremental step towards a better solution is very clear. Um, you put the initial contract in, you put the status update in, um, and you do it very quickly so that people, A, have a record of their entire contract, and it's retained in the blockchain. And then the next step from that is you verify the data in a progressively more trustless way. But in reality, I don't know, of a lot of the folks that we've spoken to, just the capacity for them to have contracts resolved by external data source rather than subjective agreement or disagreement. And the idea that you know all this data is retained in A, a legally binding way, and B, in like, a secure manner that doesn't totally depend on some startup that has business risk. Like those two things are already enough for like 70, 80% of people. The other 20 and 30% of people that you're talking with that we're kind of implicitly speaking about now that are sensitive to trustlessness and these things, yeah, this this they might not be as okay with, but they would still use it. Is that in a very yeah, long no, I, way? I just was not clear on the NXT versus no, DC. Like, I just know how smart you are. So I want to make sure I got all this I just want to make sure because I'm being smart. You just mentioned the legal binding. Yeah. Has Ash been recognized by their absolute legal binding? Because of Ash Signature? So I mean, you're storing the contract text to the Ash in the next blockchain. The bytes are the files. And then they're e signed it from your account. But the e, the e signature is that legal name. You make them put it in the legal name. They're e, they're e signing from the perspective of, of their legal name. I see. So, so okay. e, e signature is once again a spectrum, like a lot of things. It's not that good. I mean, there's case law, right? So. I mean, yeah, e signature is still an evolving spectrum. Right now, okay. they e sign it from their legal name because we make them the network. Really, this platform right now is being used by. This isn't like. Like our previous, but it's not like a dynamic marketplace where people find each other. You're not like, I built those products before. They work a certain way. This product works in a different way in the sense that you have a counterparty relationship with somebody that you want to make more trustworthy or trustless, more trustless via data. And the security of the blockchain to hold that data. That's basically what this is. Um, do you guys have customers? <laughs> Uh, users, yeah, we're starting to have some users. Any particular use case that you can show us that's live? So, yeah, a, a lot of these things are, are actually private. We've noticed that some people like to have private contracts. Surprise. <laughs> um, um, yeah, we launched a demo about two weeks ago, two, uh, three weeks ago now. So, is there so, a need to publicly start showing at events a use case of somebody's contract? I probably have to clear with that first. So, well, could you give us an example of an industry, maybe something you know that parallels one of the like ones? one that we launched, like um, service agreements. So, so guys, this is this is really the thing. Um, you have people that you want to contract around services or shipment or something like this. Because of globalization, there's more of, more of these people in other geographies. You have less and less capacity to create trust with them because different languages, you're in different jurisdictions, like, how am I going to trust the guy in the world there? Because he smiles at me over Skype, he says he's going to do it. I don't know. He's going to increase my SEO. <clears throat> maybe he will, maybe he won't. Um, yeah, the, the use cases are, 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 the ones, are, are, are the ones we more or less imagine. There is a good one for Bitcoin loans, 
between existing counterparties. There's a good one for service agreements around data sources that we launched, like SCL. And there's a good one for international trade, for, for attaching and paying the USD dollar contracts in Bitcoin, because um, surprisingly enough, there's a large amount of suppliers in China that are willing to accept Bitcoin as payment and are glad not to, uh, not to have to sign legal documents about Bitcoin because, I mean, think about signing a legal document about a thing that there's no clear... Like, you're signing a legal document about a thing that isn't formally recognized not only by your government, not even by the government of like, the really super progressive <coughs> relatively fascinating jurisdiction of the world that are going to sign a legal document to Bitcoin. You could. Are you going to go to court? I was, I was like, that's pressing, right? You know, the judge is going to have a problem with that. Um, whereas if you sign in dollars, and you have some kind of payment system, the judge can understand that. And you're like, oh, there's a payment system. This was the value of the payment. Um, you, you just mentioned the loans. How would that work? That seems like if I did a transaction on the loan, somebody would pay for me. How can I get into the right Get what? You, you mentioned the uh, loan. So, loans have a few interesting uh, dynamics. Um, one interesting dynamic in loans is guarantors. So you can have a third-party guarantor put something in the Bitcoin escrow to guarantee the payback of the loan to mitigate risk. Uh, how you can get the money back? Um, yeah, I mean, if you send the money, you can make a condition, but on something. But otherwise, you don't have to like post the Bitcoin on your You know what? Um, to guarantee the payment, I would have to put Bitcoin in escrow, which is the repayment. Right, which is the Bitcoin in well, This doesn't solve that. Uh, okay. for, Bit for Bitcoin loans, what this solves is that you have a legal agreement hashed and signed for a certain amount of money in US dollars that is paid in Bitcoin. And if you'd like, you can add a guarantor that's condition that his repayment is conditional upon the repayment of the loan. That's right. Does that answer <laughs> Uh, so, I guess, let me show you the stuff being written in the blockchain very quickly, just so we can take a look at how it looks. Uh, so here was the, this is our, in any case, it's a little screwy on this product, but that's not the correct part. In any case, here, here it is written in the NXT blockchain. Uh, even in the NXT blockchain, we have to use multiple messages. So in an NXT message, you can have a thousand, a thousand bytes instead of 40 or like 62 or, or something like this. So even in NXT, we have to use multiple messages. So here's a, another message. Uh, actually, no, that's a state change. So see, this is, this is the state change. So here's the SEO contract. There was, a, there was a state change, right? The data source reported something. We picked it up. Uh, we said, okay, there was a state change. Um, and then we wrote in that there was a state change. And then uh, the nodes, they reconstruct from, from this collection of data, if that makes sense. There's the additional contract with the conditions, then there's the state changes. So if I have multiple smart terms, I would have multiple state change messages, right? Then the multiple state change messages will reconstruct into like, one is complete, two is failed, three is complete, four is complete, five is failed. Does that make sense? So you can reconstruct the initial contract and the entirety of its progression from the perspective of data from data house in the blockchain. I guess, like, for technical people, that's probably the worst thing. I'm guessing. Um, I probably said this like six times now. At least 16 times. <coughs> so I'm 16. Um, all right, so now I guess we, get, we can do Q&A. I mean, there's a few other, oh yeah, last thing. Contract reputation. So I have 50% because I've been doing a lot of testing. But if you go to somebody's profile, let's go to. So if we go to like the profile of this guy, we have a contract completion rate. And this is like a very, very first early, early step. So you have, a, you have a reputation on the basis of data-driven contractual completion rather than like, <coughs> review scores that can be gained or 
you know, any number of other things that can be gained. And obviously, it's not like a perfect reputation system, but we also display the contracts that we've completed so people can see like, what informs the contractual reputation score. Um, this is kind of like a report by this kind of future type of thing. Yeah, if people start doing enough contracts, they will they will be able to use their contractual reputation to compel others to contract with them because they can like from a data driven perspective show like, oh, I made an agreement with your buddy and your other buddy and your other buddy, you know, and you see like see what the data shows. Delivery on time, delivery on time, delivery. Data. It's not five stars for interns. Um, Alright, okay. Question time. Yeah, about on time, that's where we are. Yeah, right yeah. Take time, all good. Yeah. Is, is there a testnet like version of this so we can move testnet coins around and try it out? Or? I have a testnet. Okay, but okay. so, uh, okay. okay. people don't get the testnet. Um, that's the first time I've ever been asked that. Um, I'm worried what you're going to find. It's a good. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good way to get what people on board. We haven't put, we haven't tested it. That's like the first request we've had for you. Um, I can think about that. We can talk if you're really interested. Then we can talk. No, I mean, I, not just me, but I think a lot of people. It's a very new field, right? So like, what is this smart contract? How does it work? And if you want to start working with it with like real money, it's kind of scary. And if you can just play around with the exact same system for free, then people might you know get a lot. Uh, yeah, yeah, but I don't need a huge. I've been building infrastructure. People, like for people that build infrastructure, they need a huge developer community and they need to get a lot of people excited and get them moving and get them building something to make the infrastructure valuable. I'm like using existing infrastructure and, and making it valuable, you know, by getting people to have economic value from it. Um, so if people have interest, sure, I'm, I'm more than open about all these things, but like I, I'm not going to go on like a, for, a worldwide forum campaign or, or chats or stuff to get a bunch of people excited to build infrastructure on top of the. But isn't that a good idea though? Having a test that people can experiment with different contract types very quickly, very easily. I mean, it seems so natural. What about just using smaller Bitcoin amounts, like a few satoshis? But that's real money, though. I mean, are you afraid of waiting for satoshis? You you can send the money back to yourself. You can just make an, um, an account and send real Bitcoin back to yourself. It'll just pass through the address that it would pass through in our system. I mean, if anybody has any questions about the system or the... If we get some more requests for testnet, I could put up a testnet version. I don't care. I mean, just, it's going to take some developer resources. I'm not sure what the benefit is. If people really want it, yeah, why not? Maybe we could do it. But um, it's only, the only one who's going to use this, maybe this is the expectation, is that those who already see the value of Bitcoin and have some kicking around, whereas you're not going to get anyone who's convinced because of this that maybe it's worth investigating Bitcoin because they don't have anything to test with. Um, people whose business is SEO. Testnet, testnet is good for developers. If there's basically enough interest for a good enough reason, we will do it. That's great. That what are your thoughts about Pythereum? <laughs> and uh, you Pythereum? know, and, uh, uh, the good stuff coming out of um, mainnet for uh, what, Ethereum? They're going to come on mainnet Q1. Are you guys going to do anything on top of uh, Ethereum at all? I don't know. i got to see it. <laughs> well, it's, it's not. It's nothing personal. I'm not like. Saying, I'm not. I'm not saying anything bad. It's just. It's very simple. In every other techno technological vertical that I've built software and that we, I've been in board meetings and that all these things have happened. There are just. There are some unique dynamics in this space. Let's put it that way. So, like, when there's something for me and our CTO and our lead backend developer and our lead cryptographer and all these people to sit down and use. We will seriously consider it, put it through the ringer, and maybe use it. And that is just a conclusively, just, I don't, it doesn't mean, that's just a normal answer, you know, it's, it doesn't mean anything. I, I'm really, like I said at the beginning, I'm super excited about all the people building infrastructure. We're all much more similar than, than we'd like to think. Right? Any, uh, any consideration of, like, is it worth totally hiding the fact that it uses cryptocurrencies at all, or is that, is that something? I mean, that's, that's really, Fine, fine line. Hiding. See, cryptocurrency. I, I don't say. I would say cryptocurrency. I would say blockchain. So you 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 don't want to freak people out by making them think that like Pablo Escobar 2.0 is your main user, <laughs> and you don't and you don't want to lose the entire value of this cool new thing that um, that you have. I mean, it's a fine line to walk. 
It's, it's, uh, it's very simply, it's tough to sell non-crypto users crypto. Um, you just have to explain it in a way that makes sense. But you still need to buy an XT to put the, this? the contract, right? Yeah. No. You don't you buy an XT at all? all? That, was a pro that was a problem with our past system. Our past system, we were tied to a few cryptocurrency limiting factors here. You don't have, we don't have a way for you to fund your account. Just make a contract. So how do you pay for it to be inserted? We pay for it. Okay. I pay for it. Okay. Well, we, not our company. We, our company pays for it, and um, instead of making you fund this and this for a few cents and blah, 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 I mean, if you do the math, and if anybody who's ever actually done the numbers on a lifetime value or customer acquisition or like all this stuff, yeah. it's a few cents. Like, you have a user willing to make they just pay. Um, I think you go first. Uh, do you have a monetization plan? Exactly what I was going to say. <laughs> no. It's on record, just remember the video is <laughs> I know it's on record. Do we have a monetization plan? Yeah, we have a monetization plan. That's better. The monetization plan is really simple. You provide economic value to people that they will then pay for at the enterprise level. And then you go down market if you can. No, not if you can, whenever you want. It's very simple. Does that make sense? It's not very specific. <laughs> Enterprise customers pay us to create trust between them and the counterparty using data. Does that answer? No. I mean, like, monetization is somebody pays you money for something. So, how does that work? Well, you guys are a startup. You're, you're discovering. You're, you're still We're exploring. Discovering. Good. 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 Each country, each state change has a, has a unique uh, key, so we can identify it. It's written out from specific locations. There, there won't be conflicting If somebody wanted to just write in a state change, to just like read what we write it in, our system just wouldn't accept it. Just be some data on the blockchain that isn't, isn't reconstructed as part of the contract. So how do you handle the case of like, uh, there's, there's two different nodes, and one of them sees, uh, so it's right around the expiration time, maybe in one. One note says that uh, the, the contract was fulfilled, another note says it expired, they both want to uh, make the contract. Um, when, when, you have a, when we have a node infrastructure that, that goes through that process, then there'll just be a consensus algorithm. Transactions will do all these things, and it'll, it'll just have to get resolved that way. Um, that answer? You mentioned for contracts that uh -huh. you want to use legal names. Is there a way to verify that, or is it just when you call the I mean, it's 0 0.1. Right. right now, for verification of legal names, yes. Um, we're going to start doing that. Um, the next contract that's coming up for us, right now we have stabilized Bitcoin payments, conditional Bitcoin escrow based on data, and uh, pay for performance service agreements, also based on data. The next one coming up for us is real estate so that you can put chain of title into the blockchain. No. You can pay for a house using conditional Bitcoin escrow, you can pay the broker using conditional Bitcoin escrow. You can transfer chain of title on the blockchain, um, which is actually pretty cool. And for that, we would need to start the chain of title off on a good foot and need some amount of verification. Uh, so yeah, we like it's, it's, yes, it's on our roadmap right now we need to verification. Does that answer your question? Yes. We, right now we just assume that the two people like know each other, and like, if you're going to send a million dollars in Bitcoin to this guy, you're going to like be on the phone, Joe, are you locked in? You are, okay, good, you good? I'm going to be good. Did you hit the button? Is <laughs> here? I said, yes, I'm here. Did I hit the button? Yes, okay, good. You sure? Yes. That's basically how it works. I have a couple of questions. So, in your um, in smart contract platform, when you're signing two or three signature for the multi sig let's say, when the contract terms are fulfilled, how are you? pulling in the data and signing it, and then if that is an NXT, which I understand. What's an NXT? The data. data. The, uh, the and how does that work to get back to the signing of the different blockchain? So how it works is our, um, everything that we need to do for the contract is reconstructed from the data we put into the blockchain. In the NXT? Yes. So we just repeat that as if it were a database. 
We find the, 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 you know, the incremental steps we have to take there. Then we, we have the API feeds. Um, we verify the data there. Um, then there's a result. We write a state change. Yeah? And then, and then the signature happens. And then about the signature, there's also a state change message. So that all, all the individual things that occur, they uh, are recorded in the blockchain. Does that answer your question? So in, to get to the state change, is that, how is that done in your, is it all? You have to verify the data. You, you read what's in the blockchain in terms of the JSON. You see what the incremental steps are, what you need to verify, what you know, the API needs to Who's show. Who's you? Is that me? It's, it's, a, it's, it's a smart contract. It's a smart contract. Yeah. Yeah. It's, 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 right. <coughs> that has to verify the data. And then that will, um, will create a state change for completion or failure, which if there's an additional Bitcoin escrow, which will also release the money. But the key thing is that all of that is all those steps, all of that is written into the blockchain. You can reconstruct what happened. You do not have to rely on us for that. Like we do not internally keep this stuff. So is the NXT pinging the, the SEO rank every about every two minutes? We're acting as what's called an oracle and pinging the, the, the SEO. And every two minutes it's reported and you can block what If something is. happens, yes. Okay. Which is why we started with public data sources and all the things I mentioned before. Uh, I think you could. Yeah, so uh, in your role as an oracle, what's what's the scope of contracts or, that you'd be willing to sort of verify? Um, that's I mean, a good question. Is that it? Yeah. Um, that's a, that's a, that's a, you see, the interesting thing that we've noticed is that both parties need to verify, we need to trust the, the data source. So the first dimension is, is there, is there some kind of trust that the data source will create? Well, I guess I, I was wondering, I mean, when you talk about a data source, you sort of are jumping the gun and assuming that the data has already been created. Like, if I want to have a contract about somebody painting my house... That's in general. Okay. That's what you're asking. Sure. Well, okay. yeah. So, what, what what do you consider subjective? Like, where do you draw this line as far as what the, the if data there is data, if there is data that two counterparties so data is what usually when somebody creates it. Yeah. So this is not like an all-encompassing magical solution that can cook you pancakes and wash your car and like solve your financial problems. It doesn't do everything. It's like yes, there are some things for which there is no data. Perhaps we will all be cyborgs that data will appear. There are some things there is data for, and you can now contract around it. You can also, in theory, give people signatures. And you know, if you give you know, five people signatures and you make a contractual agreement that says that four or five people sign off and you know, they paint the house, then you know, that would be the same. That would be, does that answer? Does that make sense? I, I guess so. Yeah, I, I can sort of see where you're going with it. I'm not sure completely. There's just certain things that are subjective. There's a spectrum. So, so like, what, what's, can you give an example of objective data that's not, you know? GPS data about a shipping container. SEO rank. Site traffic. Bitcoin payments. Very objective data. Right. I guess somebody's still looking at something and interpreting it and creating numbers or some software is doing that. You know, right? And there's somewhere where, where some real life thing is being turned into numbers. So I get, yeah, that's, that's all I was wondering. Okay. Yeah. Um, what happens if one of the data providers goes out and say you're depending on some sort of third party API for... Yeah, we have a monitoring backend that makes sure to monitor if you're up all the time. Well, it goes out have redundancies. Or even if it just, you know, if the service is discontinuous. You have a redundancy for Google rank? With what? If Google goes down, you have a redundancy for Google rank? We don't actually get it from Google. We get it from a few places like SCMRush and a few other people. Mm -hmm. And then we have a monitoring backend to make sure the API is up. And that's part of something that we're realizing we have to do as an Oracle, and that as a network of nodes we'll have to do as Oracles. They'll need to have redundancies, they'll need to monitor, they'll need to pick up if there's a problem with their data sources. Like, as you build this, you start to realize that you're going to have to do some of those things. I mean, like, you have to get the data, there's no way to get around, right? There's data, and there's places to get So, what do you do if one of the places you get the data that service is discontinued? Redundancy. It's just like redundancy. And all of these confirmations, like a lot of with, with these types of things, a lot of the standard answers are redundant. See how many confirmations you have, you have a lot of confirmations, it's redundant. You have a lot of data sources, it's redundant. And okay, there's always some probability of something, but you know, for all that know, media could like I don't know. You know what I mean? 
Last question. You talked about the Google contract. You talked about the private contract. Here we go. You said that, that some, a lot of the use case right now is private contracts. In the case of a private contract, is the contract text and JSON encrypted into Next? And if so, how do you evaluate, or do you have visibility into it, and the rest of the public doesn't? How does that work? We are actually just now starting to launch a private contract. So, so wait, but you said that's what people are using right now. Like, they're starting to use it for that. So we're working with folks that like the system, but they want a private contract version. And you're basically right, we have to encrypt it, and then we have to designate another account that can decrypt it to view it, because they don't want other people to view it. They can designate if they want somebody to arbitrate, or they can designate if they want it to be public, or they can designate it as entirely private. But then there are some interesting dynamics about whether you do or you don't count that for the contract reputation score, which is uh, you know an entirely different question. Um, but does that answer your question? Yeah, basically. So they can designate a third party in that 203 multi -city. You give them some optionality with these things. Do they want an arbitrator? Do they want us to have capacity? Do they want us to have capacity? And we have certain responsibilities. We, we, might, we may have responsibilities in front of them. If they don't want us to have capacity, then guys, like you encrypted everything, please, love of Christ, don't lose your password. But, you know, please don't do it. Uh, I'm just saying this. Um, don't lose your password. Mm -hmm. I'm like gonna make a, I'm gonna make a meme about this to make it popular so that people can do this. Um, any anything else? Any other questions? Oh, we're good. We're done. That's it. It's rock and roll.